What's going on, fellas? This is Mike D with Black Fathers Now. And yo, we have a dope conversation that's coming down the pipe today. Really, really cool conversation with a really accomplished brother who's doing some really good things, you know, within our world. And um, so the brother that we have on today, he's a husband and a father of four. He's the CEO of Campaign for Black Male Achievement. You know, under his leadership, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement has leveraged more than $212 million in national and local funds for black male achievement. We're really going to dive into that for sure. Um, but prior to that, man, he spent almost two decades as a youth development professional, community builder, and advocate for children and families. Fellas and ladies listening to, because we know y'all like to, you know, to peek in on what we're talking about. <laughs> Let's welcome my man, Sean Dub, the CEO of Campaign for Black Male Achievement. How you doing, brother? I'm doing fantastic, Mike D. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as we were sharing in uh, the preamble, uh, we've been trying to do this for uh, probably a close to a year now. It's been a minute. It's been a minute. <laughs> And I just firmly believe nothing before uh, it's divine time. And so I'm supposed to be speaking to you and you to me on today uh, in this moment. And uh, I think we met at the Black Enterprise uh, Martin Men uh, Gathering. Is that where we met? No, actually, let me tell you what's funny. And this, this is honestly taking it full circle. I live in Knoxville, Tennessee. Oh, okay. Yeah, and cool. you actually were in Knoxville for a conference. It was something that was going the on. United conference, one of our partners. Yes. Th that's right. And but the funny thing is, you and I connected like the week after you left Knoxville. So we physically never connected. And so I don't know how somebody mentioned you and mentioned the conference. And I started looking it up and I saw campaign for black male achievement. I'm like, well, what is this? This is cool. Then I was like, hold up. They're in Knoxville. They're in Knoxville like last week. I'm like, ah, oh, let me email this guy. So I emailed you and you and I started a, a you know, correspondence back and forth only to find out you were in the city a week prior. And then, uh, but then we, we kept it going and I've been on some of the calls, the, the monthly uh, calls or whatnot with Black, uh, Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And, you know, so it's been, it's been awesome. I've been following a lot of what you all are doing and we're going to dive into that in a little bit, but we have not physically met yet. Okay. We're going to make that happen though. That day will come, and uh, thank God for social media and uh, uh, technology, because I feel like we have. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, look, we're, we're connected, whether it's in person or virtual. We are connected. <laughs> well, but, you know, so getting started with this particular interview, you know, before I jump into a brother's story, I always like to have the brothers give a shout-out, you know, to give a shout-out to their village, to their support system, because behind and beside every great man is a village. And so we need to make sure that we give our village, our support system, thus do, uh, just do. And so uh, first, I want to give you a, the, fl the platform to give some shout outs to, to your team and the folks that mean a lot to you there, brother. Wow. Wow. You know, so many folks have poured into uh, me that we can take up the entire hour with me uh, uh, giving shout outs. Right. And so I uh, uh, certainly have to start with my mom, uh, uh, Deanna, strong Jamaican woman. Mm. Uh, who believed, uh, grew up in an area, uh, era where she believed uh, not in a timeout, but uh, uh, in knockout. Mm -hmm. And um, she uh, immigrated from uh, Jamaica, was a strong, independent woman. Uh, she and my father were never married. Uh, and uh, she just, just, just demonstrated through the way she lived her life and, and, and just taught me about uh, sacrifice. She taught me about resiliency. She taught me about making a way when there was no way, uh, but also about enjoying life. And she mm -hmm. exposed me uh, uh, to, uh, to, to so much. And so she is right now uh, living her best retired life in South Florida. Wow. Uh, I got to thank uh, certainly my wife, uh, uh, Desiree, my divine uh, uh, mate. Uh, and, you know, quite frankly, and I love the uh, transparent conversation we were having Absolutely. And, and um, I, you know, this is my second marriage, right? Mm -hmm. My first marriage, seven years, married my college sweetheart and, you know, uh, learned the lesson of, uh, you know, you're making a decision with your head and not with your heart. Mm -hmm. And um, when I got out of that marriage, uh, I was a, a, a madman, crazy man. Uh, I just want to say my uh, nickname back in the day was the Love Dove. Oh, and wow. So <laughs> well, look, the, hold on. The Love Dove. You can run. You can run with that. And I um, 
wholeheartedly believe that uh, God said, I got plans for this brother, but he, if he continues uh, in the behavior and the way that he is living, he's not going to make it, right? So mm. uh, I want to uh, give him, um, in one woman, his wife, the eventual mother of his children, and uh, his mistress, right? Mm. And so over the last 25 years, you know, quite frankly, I uh, did not think that uh, uh, monogamy uh, was possible, right? Mm. And uh, nothing that I'm bragging, I'm, I'm counting that just like I'm counting my uh, clean time, right? Part of my story, I have uh, uh, gone on 30 years of uh, recovery, September 1st, uh, clean from drinking and, and drugging, but certainly have to uh, thank my wife. And, uh, you know, we've Amen. been in 25 years, and she reminds me uh, all the time. She said, you know, the reason for our longevity is because of her, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> Shout out to my four children, uh, Nia, Maya, Cameron, and Caleb, um, that has, you know, uh, brought me to this conversation with you in Black father Fatherhood. They've taught me so much, right? It has been the most rewarding experience and challenging and learning and growthful uh, experience. And it continues, right? It, it, it never ends. And then I just have a host of mentors and, you know, folks like uh, Reverend Alfonso Wyatt and uh, Jeff Canada and Susan Taylor, and I can go on and on. There's one sister, Terry Williams, you may know, mm -hmm. uh, who's the author of Black Pain, right? Mm. And uh, really began to address uh, the mental health challenges in the black uh, uh, community, right? And I remember two things I want to lift up Terry Williams uh, that she said to me over the years. And uh, one, and I used to run a youth uh, newspaper in Harlem when I was working at the Harlem Children's Zone, and I had her come back, come to us, uh, speak to uh, uh, my students, uh, my writers and advertisers. And, uh, you know, sometimes someone is telling a story and you think they're telling it for someone else, but it boomerangs and it hits you. Mm. She said something uh, to the young folks in the room, and she said, if you are not uh, walking out the house most days and uh, you don't have butterflies in your stomach because of what God is calling you to do and the mm. leadership challenge that you are uh, a call to do, uh, you are living a pathetic life, right? I thought it was like, gosh, she's being hard on the kids, right? Uh, but that's true, right? And so uh, she said that, and that stuck with me. And one thing she also uh, said is that uh, what you think uh, is your curse uh, could be uh, your calling in disguise. Mm. And, whoa, 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 park, park that. Say that what you think could be your curse. Well, what you think is your curse could be your yeah. calling in disguise. Ooh. And, um, you know, that's a synopsis of, uh, of my life, right? I've had uh, uh, adversity and advances and uh, uh, the, the issue of perspective, right? And how you look at things. And so, you know, and want to lift up the team of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. And we got thousands of leaders across uh, uh, the nation that uh, support us and lead this work. We're just a catalyst uh, in this movement of black male achievement. And there are a host of, we're talking about fatherhood, you know, brothers like Kenneth Braswell at Father's mm. Week, Joe Jones, Center for Urban uh, 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 Families. Uh, um, and there's so many, right? Mm -hmm. Once you start listing uh folks you, you know people listen oh you didn't you didn't mention me right <laughs> uh, i want to say charge it uh, uh to my head and, and and not my heart but i have been blessed immeasurably with having some amazing people in my life right mm -hmm. both as mentors as mentees, people that have seen things in me that I have not seen in myself uh, before, you know, I saw them in myself. And that, and many times it was just a word, you know, the right word at the right time can have a transformational uh, uh, impact, right? And uh, uh, so, you know, I can go on and on, uh, but certainly at the top of that list, you know, my mother, my wife, my family, um, Reverend Alfonso White and Jeff uh, uh, Canada, right, uh, mm -hmm. are amazing mentors. And uh, guys like uh, the late Richard Murphy uh, and, and, and a John Simon who ran a youth program that 
when I was uh, 12, 13 years old, and I thought I wanted to sell loose joints on the corner of 80th Street and Amsterdam Avenue in Manhattan, and you know, catchy slogans, uh, pass me by, you won't get high. And, and I didn't have to be doing that, but uh, two blocks away was a youth program, and they had a basketball team and basketball tryouts. Got involved there, changed my life, or, or the, the trajectory of my life. And, you know, uh, 12 years after that, I was uh, the executive director, 12, 14 years of that, that, that youth program. Wow. And so, uh, and, and Jeff Canada also, that, who is the founder of the Harlem Children's Zone, right? And so, uh, yes, as you said, in um, opening and reading my bio, and I think, you know, sometimes it's important for us to hear our bio, Mm -hmm. uh, because we're in the midst of our work and there's a voice in our heads and this happens a lot as a father uh the voice tells you uh you know i got two voices i don't know about that but i got <laughs> I, I learned about three or four voices what you talking about <laughs> and, 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 you know and you know one voice is telling you that uh you, you're a great dad and uh uh, you're doing fantastic, and uh, you, Sean, you didn't grow up with your father, and you are doing fantastically, right? But then there's another voice that says you are falling short, right? And every mm. shortcoming and everything that is not going right in your family, your life, that's because you're a bad dad, right? And I always say that, you know, it comes with uh, fatherhood, uh, a lot of thrills and spills, mm. Mm. right? Big and, time that it's important to uh, continuously work on yourself. I know that when I am working on myself and I'm aligned and I'm in purpose and, and uh, uh, I got my uh, uh, mental health and emotional social well-being relatively in check, I'm a, be I'm a better father. Mm -hmm. When I don't, um, I am more impatient, right? I am more uh, 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 judgmental. Uh, I am when, you know, my children uh, do something that uh, reminds me of my shortcomings, right? Uh, that, that just seems magnified. And so fatherhood is, and black fatherhood is just beautiful, right? Mm, it and is. I, I'm grateful that I have grown up in an era that we've seen a transformation uh, particularly with black men and our ability to tell each other that uh, we love each other, mm -hmm. to drop the mask and to be able to say, I'm scared, I'm hurting. Uh, I had separate conversations with my father-in-law, my late father-in-law, who uh, um, died of cancer back in 2004. Uh, my biological dad, who I never lived with, he eventually got married and left that marriage. But uh, in separate conversations, they used the same terminology uh, of uh, how they were feeling um, when they left their families, mm. right? And it was like really surreal, eerie that they, in separate conversation, they both described it as they felt the walls closing in and they left, right? Mm. And they grew up in an era as black men, you had to uh, say, I got this. I'm strong. I can't let another brother see me weak. Mm. Uh, I can't go to somebody else and say, look, I'm struggling in this marriage. I'm struggling as a father mm. and I need help, right? And so they they just left. Cause I said, you know how many times I feel like the walls are, are closing in? Mm -hmm. I've grown up in a um, era. And I think uh, my experience uh, in recovery uh, therapeutic uh, communities, Narcotics Anonymous, and sharing and building community has helped me with uh, coping, being, uh, expressive. Mm -hmm. and, but I have a whole network of men, black men, where uh, we're able to share, uh, hold each other uh, uh, accountable, cry. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, Brother Jason uh, Wilson, who is in the mm -hmm. network, who mm -hmm. has book out cry like a man and what that is doing for us as fathers right and so i just think that um and i don't even know how i got down this thread uh when i was talking about my uh father my and and, and father-in-law but just being grateful that i'm uh in this era 
where we have a Mike Dorsey that has a podcast, Black mm-hmm. Fathers Now, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, part of one of the mantras of the campaign for Black male achievement is we got to become masters of our own media, right? Yes. And so I know because I've published, uh, I've done what you're doing, uh, publications. One of my publications was called mm-hmm. Proud Papa for African American Fathers. Um, the consistency of doing that, right? The, uh, what you are doing, um, showing up for the interviews. Will people listen? You don't know, but you are being consistent and you're putting it out there and that there's one person that may listen to one of your episodes. Might not be the latest, might not be this one. Uh, it might be an episode that you might say that, God, that was a bomb. Mm -hmm. Someone hears something and it literally saves their life, right? Can, can I tell you the, the thing that you're just saying, and this is what I want the brothers to really pay attention to, is the fact that it's not about the, the, the width, it's about the depth, right? Because the thing is, we, we all want to go wide, right? We all want to spread out and touch millions and millions of people, but you don't realize you have the ability to impact millions of lives with one person. I was listening to, um, actually, it was on a previous interview that I did not long ago, and a guy quoted Tupac. And he said a line from Tupac, and I might be throwing it off a little bit, Mm -hmm. but he said that Tupac stated that I might not be the brother who can do it, but I might be inspiring the one who can. That's right. You stop and you think about that. And the other part of it is this. If you can go deep with one individual and you change that individual's life, their family changes. So that means you've changed a family for generations to come just by impacting one person. Yes. Right. And what you just said also about the notion of you don't know who's going to listen and what things fall on. And basically, as a speaker and as a as a person who presents information, the only thing that I can control is what I put out there. I really can't control how people take it. Right. But I will tell you this. It is a beautiful thing when you go online and you start looking at your data and you realize that there has not been one day since I've dropped a podcast that somebody has not downloaded it at least once. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing to think about that every day since this thing has been going on, somebody has listened to something as it pertains to Black Fathers Now. So to your point, it's not about the numbers, it's about the impact. And if yeah. you can impact one person, that one person, you might, might, might not be the one who changes the world, but you could be talking to that person who can. You could be inspiring that person who can. And, and brother, thank you for that. The, the power of story. And I know that you're interviewing me, but I got to ask you, mm-hmm. what inspired you to start this platform, this medium of Black Fathers Now? Wow. That is a really great question, man. I'm going to tell you, I was doing, before Black Fathers Now launched, I did a podcast called The Fit Urban Life Show. And so I did 122 episodes of The Fit Urban Life Show. But as we got towards the end of it, you know, it, it just really, I just didn't feel the fire with The Fit Urban Life Show. So long story short, I was, I shut it down for a few months and was just kind of doing a lot of reevaluation of, you know, where I was, what direction I was going in. And one thing, as ideas were popping, one thing really kept coming to the forefront and it was fatherhood right? It was fatherhood. Everything that I was doing literally kind of revolved back to this whole concept of fatherhood. And on a personal level, you know, I was fortunate to grow up with, you know, my father and I've had grandfathers and uncles and people in my life. But I also grew up and it was when you mentioned the whole notion of addiction, you know, I also grew up in a household in which, you know, my father struggled with the disease of addiction. So I saw, you know, a great person, but then I also saw how, you know, the disease of addiction can take that great person and change who they are. And so being the kid in that particular scenario, you know, I saw a lot of what I did not want to be. And so for me, thinking about it from that perspective, as I became a husband and as I became a father, you know, I always thought back to that feeling of what I didn't want my kids or my wife to feel at times. And so to that point, it made me also want to, you know, pour into brothers because, you know, I've also been blessed to have mentors and leaders and coaches and uncles and, you know, and my father and I have a great relationship, you know, to this day and I had grandfathers. I had all of these strong men around me and they were able to pour into me. And I was like, you know, this whole concept of it takes a village to raise a child is extremely important. But the thing is, we don't technically live in villages anymore, but we have technology. So why not take technology and bring that village to the brothers? Hence the tagline of Black Fathers Now, bringing the village to the brothers. 
And so honestly, I just opened up my network and started contacting brothers and asked them to share their stories as it pertains to fatherhood. And what's interesting, some of the brothers that I've interviewed aren't fathers, but they have some level of insight and wisdom that black men can take and apply to their life. And so the title Black Fathers Now is about bringing insight and information and wisdom to the brothers that they can take and apply to their life right now. So it's not about just theory, it's yeah. about action. And you know, I have a, uh, I mentioned uh, one of my mentors, uh, Reverend Alfonso Wyatt, right? Mm -hmm. He uh, does not have any biological uh, children, but he has mentored and fathered uh, hundreds, if not thousands, generational leads, right? Wow. And so you can be a biological father and not uh, uh, be loving, uh, uh, protective and, 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 and prayerful and uh, uh, prophetic and speaking into your children's lives. Um, and you can uh, not necessarily be the biological or have biological children, but you can father. Mm. Uh, 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 and I think that we have to elevate that more. And, you know, you said the, the village does not technically exist in the way uh, I think that uh, the, the African proverb uh, arose, uh, but there is community. Absolutely. There is networks. And our ability to be connected to uh, uh, one another and to pour into uh, each other. And so much of it is telling our stories. Yes. Right? Yes. It's uh, yes. telling our stories. And I think that what's really important, like, so... Uh, I am uber uh, transparent with my uh, 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 children, uh, so they have uh, they, they know the good and they see the bad. And plus, when you're living with someone, you know you can't uh, hide. Yep, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> you, can't, you can't hide that uh, uh, anyway, right? And so, uh, yes, people know the story of uh, me and the campaign for Black Male Achievement and what we have managed to do. Uh, but people also know that, um, you know, when I was a 24-year executive director of uh, the uh, organization that I uh, grew up in, the Dome Project, I had to make a most pivotal decision in my life. Uh, this is way before fatherhood, right? To uh, surrender um, and uh, go into uh, recovery, right? And mm. it mentioned, and I, and I respect that you... Um, to the disease of addiction, right? Yes. And why this conversation around fatherhood is really important, and particularly for men that uh, have not grown up with a close, in proximity example, right? Whether in the home or in constant relationship of what a responsible, sober, man and father and how that person shows up, this can be re real fearful. Mm -hmm. It can be real fearful. And I had someone tell me, uh, this guy ran a um, therapeutic community. And what he said to me, he said, you know, addicts are some of the most creative, talented people, as you were describing your father, mm -hmm. that I have ever come across. But that fear of their own talent mm. causes the self-sabotage and then the, uh, the, the, the addiction, right? And we know the, um, and every father should read this uh, poem, right? This should be a fatherhood uh, anthem, right? And while uh, Nelson Mandela gets a lot of credit for it, uh, Marianne Williamson was the original author mm -hmm. that talks about, uh, it is not, you know, our greatest fear is not our light. I mean, it's not our darkness. It is our light. Yes. Right? Yes. And as fathers, we need to be in community mm. so that we can help each other grow into our light, right? And grow into our light. And so that's why I really appreciate uh, what you're doing. And when you talk about uh, Black fathers, uh, I think a, a transformational a moment for me in my career was when I launched uh, back in 2006 uh, 
this magazine called news magazine called Proud Papa uh, for African American uh, uh, fathers, and uh, you know there was a Genesis story around that, right? And uh, at the time, I was uh, the vice president of a national mentoring organization, and uh, I'm sure you've experienced this. You come home for the weekend, and you got one foot in the previous week, and all that uh, went down, and you didn't do, and you're focusing on that. The other foot is in the next week coming up, mm. what you have to do, and you're not present, right? Yes, yes. And I remember this weekend when uh, I was, that's where I was, and I was impatient and talking about, you know, crying over spilled milk, mm -hmm. literally crying over spilled milk as a dad, right? The spills and the thrills. And, uh, you know, at the time, uh, my oldest daughter and I, uh, we would periodically uh, give each other notes, right? Uh -huh. uh, and you know, in her uh, uh, lunchbox, she would do a note, or she would, uh, I would give her a note, and she would leave me a note, um, and on my desk. And I remember hopping on the commuter train that Monday morning, like feeling like a a, a, a horrible dad, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, feeling like, uh, God, I'm stumbling through the dark, man. I don't know what I'm doing, right? And so I'm on New Jersey Transit and I go into my bag to do work, right? And I pull out this note, right? And uh, there's this note from Nia that says, you know, uh, you're a great dad, Sean. Uh, she didn't say Sean, she said you're a great dad. <laughs> Um, although my uh, firstborn son, I have twin boys, uh -huh. uh, Cameron, there was a period there he was into calling me Sean, right? <laughs> Back in the day, you know, that was like, you'd be fetching your lips, but that's a whole other story. That's a different story. <laughs> and so there was this note, and she was like, talked about how great a dad I was, and all the kids at uh, my school would love to have you uh, mm. as uh, their dad. And here I am, Monday morning, uh, commuting to work, I'm like crying, right? Mm. And you know that uh, when you're commuting, you have, uh, you're in the same car, you see the same passengers and commuters and folks looking at me like, man, this brother needs another job because mm. it is, you know, he crying. Crying right on the way to work. Uh -huh. But I was crying because um, what it exposed for me was that uh, I needed help, right? And uh, I think that uh, one of the things I've been gifted to do that when I am in pain, it blossoms my purpose, right? Mm. And, I and I get creative and I, I create stuff, right? And uh, that's when I had the idea to create a, a proud papa and uh, created this newspaper that wasn't focused on celebrity dads, mm -hmm. but everyday black fathers that we see but the media, right? The media wants uh, the world to believe that we are pimps, players, yeah, uh, perpetrators, uh, but we are loving fathers. We are yes. proud fathers, right? And so I took that moment uh, and created Proud Pop. And quite frankly, at the time, I didn't even realize that uh, there was this growing responsible fatherhood movement, right? Mm. And uh, so I have people, you know, and, and I did it for a season, similar to the yeah. uh, podcast that you originally did, right? And it was for a purpose. It was for a season. People still keep asking me, when is Proud Papa going to come back? The middle pull-out pages were Youth Voices, and it was called Middle Passage wow. uh, uh, Press. And um, it was able to, and I still have people today that I love providing what you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, a platform for others' voices, yes. for other stories, right? And so uh, that was a story of a, a, a proud papa. And uh, I've just seen over the years uh, so much across the nation that, uh, particularly for black fathers, mm. uh, a vehicle for us to voice uh, our victories, yes, our defeats, right? Yes, all of it. Yeah. Because you tell the whole story. You got to you, let me tell you when I um one of my speaking topics is this is concept called double down on you, right? And when I start talking about it, one of the things that I use to give the story is I talk about a puzzle, right? Each and every one of us is basically a big five hundred piece jigsaw puzzle. And so when you look at that jigsaw puzzle, there's some good pieces. There's some pieces that aren't so good. There are pieces that you put out front, but then there are pieces that you try to hide. But the thing about a puzzle is that that puzzle is not complete until all those pieces are there. 
right? But there's another caveat to that. If I hand you one piece to a 500 piece puzzle, you can't define what that puzzle is going to look like by looking at one piece. Most of us take one piece to our 500 piece jigsaw puzzle and we lead with that and that alone, but we're not telling the whole story. And so when people take a step back and think about themselves, when you start to look in the mirror and realize you're this jigsaw puzzle with some good stuff, some bad stuff, some stuff that you're embarrassed about, stuff that you want to hide, but then there's stuff that you really, you want to shine, you want everybody to see, but all of those are pieces of you. Not one of them defines you entirely, but you also are incomplete without all of those pieces being in place. But we have to be come to come to grips with all of that so that we can be that holistic person and walk forth with the power that we've been uh, been ordained to walk in. That's good. That's good because we're both. And uh, what I one of the things I always say uh, is that we are infinitely more favored than we are flawed. Yes, we're both right. But how you show up depends on what you focus on the most, right? Ooh, 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 hold up, and hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up. That, that, how, how you, because I'm gonna tell you, I came across a quote that you dropped on social media not long ago, and it applies directly to this. And it was a quote that you left from, uh, from Robert Smith's Morehouse Commencement. Ooh, you yeah. stated, oh dude, you dropped one and you said, between your doubt and your destiny lies your action. And that's from Robert Smith from his Morehouse Commencement. With everything that you've been saying, everything that you're talking about in regards to even when Nelson Mandela was mentioning the notion of uh, we fear our light, not our darkness, what you just mentioned kind of falls in line with that. Between your doubt and your destiny lies your action. Talk to us a little bit about that, because that's something that you put out there in regards to something going on with Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Sure, right. And what I love about uh, that quote, right, so... The $40 million was really important, right? Yes. Transformational, right? Uh, but everybody is not going to get that $40 million, right? That was mm -hmm. for the 2019 graduates, right? But everyone can take that quote, right? And the full quote, the other part of the quote was, you know, first he said, beyond, uh, what, between your doubt and your destiny, and the fact, admitting that there is doubt, mm -hmm. right? The, sometimes we, we try to fake like we're going around, like there is no doubt, you know? I puzzle see, pieces. I don't have fear, right? So the puzzle we, pieces. Mm -hmm. So it's your action, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so you got to do something, take that first step. And then he, the second part of the quote was that between our community and the American dream lies your leadership, right? Mm. And that resonated with me because one of our uh, core uh, mission mantras of the campaign for Black Male Achievement, since we're doing this uh, a visual, this yeah. uh, ten year anniversary awesome. uh, impact report, is that uh, I always, uh, whenever I get an opportunity to share, is I say, you know, there is no cavalry coming to save the day in our community, right? Mm -hmm. That uh, we are the iconic leaders that we have been waiting for. Uh, the curators of the change we're seeking to see, right? And that we all have, no matter what your story is, right, we have something in us that can be contributed to our greater good. Mm. But it will never happen in a vacuum, right? It will never happen. It happens like when Sean Dove and Mike Dorsey connect Right. Absolutely. And, and, and I bring my greatest good and my favor and I connected with your greatest good and your favor. And we also acknowledge our floors. Yes. The, of the parts are greater than the whole. Right. Synergy. It's, it's, it's a synergy. Right. And it's, mo and it's momentum. And so, so much of what we've done over the last 11 years for the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Right. And this isn't new work. Right. This is 400 years work. Right. Yes. I in the campaign uh, too often get credit that where it's not due. Uh, we were, and I was in the right place at the right time with the right partners, with the right leadership to catalyze this present day moment, right? Mm -hmm. But this is 400 year work, right? And it's really about building community. Mm. It's really about creating spaces where we can collaborate, right? And that's why it's so important, like these fatherhood groups coming around the table uh, in a circle of trust, or even having that one person, that one other dad 
that I can't tell this, what I'm going through to anybody else, but I can let him know, right? Because I mm-hmm. trust him. And he's been through this. And I, you know, I can share, right? Because in recovery, they say you're only as sick as your secrets, right? Mm. And so wow. the, the power of relationship is uh, phenomenal. Uh, we have certainly put a, a great deal of res- resources on the ground. But when we talk about uh, Robert Smith uh, and that $40 million, um, the relationships that he is engendering through his work and his uh, uh, Black philanthropic mission, it just so happens that uh, we do an annual restoration retreat, and I'll send you a link to it. Uh, last year uh, was the first uh, year on his property in Lincoln Hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're going to be in Colorado. We're going to be there uh, uh, next week. Uh, we're, um, he opens up the space. Uh, we bring uh, 40 uh, uh, young men from across the country, uh, from seven cities, uh, fly fishing, horseback riding, archery, uh, workshops, wow. and getting into nature, nature, yoga, meditation. And so... Um, yeah, that quote, uh, you know, certainly running with that quote. You know, one of my other, uh, uh, that's why I love, you know, Twitter is like the digital underground. Uh, yeah, it is. <laughs> um, one of the things, and I think that uh, dads, black fathers, um, we, and all people that have uh, grown through traumatic s- scenarios, mm-hmm. that... Broken crayons in the right hands can still be used to create a life masterpiece. Mm. Broken so, crayons in the right hands. Crayons, right. And so mm. uh, in the right hands, right? And for me, you know, that's in God's hands. Right? Absolutely. Me too. Absolutely. Like in mentor's hands, right? It can be broken, but how you use it, right? And too often... Um, we feel broken, mm. right? And we need to be placed and used in the right hand. And the picture needs to be put up like, this is what you created with mm. your crayon on that is you, the color. Look, look at this, right? Wow. And once we get these little victories and these successes and you'd be like, oh, snap. I'm, I'm refraining now. I don't know if there's profanity. <laughs> It's on, all good. You're good. Okay, all right. All right you know, okay, so, uh, you know, but, you know, also, I did that, right? And so one of the stories that I tell um, that, and I have plenty from my children, right? And, oh, wow. It just so happens. Uh-huh. <laughs> I have, uh, so I'm in my study, right? So this is journal is from uh, 2011, right? Okay. And in this journal... Where is uh? Because I gotta use this for uh. What the heck happened to it? Somewhere in this journal is supposed <laughs> to be. Oh wow! What happened to that? That's weird. It must have fallen out. It's uh, all good. A take up dollar bill. Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, that's deep. Um, and there's a story behind that taped up uh, uh, dollar bill. So, so, so now I got distracted because I want to find out where that dollar- Where that dollar bill went. <laughs> dollar bill, right? So, but let me just tell the story uh, 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 behind, uh, behind it. Okay. Because it's a true story. I want to pull it <laughs> uh, the dollar bill. So I want to be, a, I want to be on an OCD mission after this. After I this know, story. right? Once it's done. <laughs> so my um, twin boys, uh, they might've been around, uh, uh, four, no more than five, right? Uh, we're having a, a spat, right? And my wife, Desiree, and I we were in this phase where we were trying time out, right? Uh-huh. So I separated the boys and I sent Cameron up to his room, uh, who was the firstborn uh, 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 twin, and remind me to tell the Caleb Bleach story. I don't know how much time we have, but oh man, as long as you want, brother, we good. So, so um. <laughs> Cameron, you know, went upstairs in his room. He was having a temper tantrum, and there was a dollar bill in his room, and he, like, ripped up the uh, a, a dollar bill. 
and their older sister Nia came out of the room, right? So she hates this. She, she loves the good stories that I tell about her, but she hates this story because she's uh -huh. seen as the uh, antagonist, right? And and Nia's the firstborn, you know, learn how to ride a bike in one day, on um, honor roll since uh, uh, first grade. The hero of the family, you mm -hmm. know, there was a, a, a season when when you know Desiree and I would tell the kids to do something, they'd be like, "Let me get back to you. Uh, we'll check with Nia first, right?" Uh. So, but anyway, you know, Nia comes out of the room and uh, she looks inside Cameron's room and she sees a ripped up dollar bill and she comes downstairs and uh, she does a little tattletale and says, this is what uh, Cameron did. He ripped up the dollar bill that has no value, right? My, uh, my middle child, classic middle child, she's stuck in between her hero big sister and these cute chubby twins, has always been searching to find a way, has uh, had trouble in school. Mm -hmm. And Maya, who uh, was downstairs and saw this scene, Mia came down and threw the pieces of the dollar bill on the counter and said it had no value. Uh, this is something I will like, like never forget, right? She uh, got up, I think she was watching Dora the Explorer, and she got up and she went into the kitchen, right? And opened uh -huh. the kitchen drawer. Now, Mike, I don't know what your kitchen drawer looks like, but <laughs> this is what my everywhere. It's stuff everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> batteries and wires and yeah. stuff long gone out of stock that you'll never use in the kitchen. And she rummaged through the kitchen drawer and she found a scotch tape, right? Mm -hmm. And just taking the risk and searching, right? Because this is some messy work, right? Mm -hmm. She uh, got the scotch tape and she taped up the dollar bill. And she said, here, Dad, it still has value. Mm. Right? And that was a transformational moment for her because she has always lived in the shadow of her, her sibling. Wow. And to have the gumption to do that. And what it told me is that so many of us uh, feel like, and so many of us fathers and Black men, uh, feel like that ripped up dollar bill that we have no value, right? Mm. That we need folks to take a risk to go into messy drawers, right? Uh, risk in getting poked with nails and tacks and, and, and stuff mm. in that drawer and find some tools to help heal and help mend and, and, and help to uh, 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 put us uh, uh, together and have value, right? And in that process, we have to shift the narrative because yes. what she did was uh, she defied the expert of the house. The expert mm -hmm. said, uh, this has no more value, right? And so we had to, and she had to be the disruptor and say, you know what? I'm ignoring what popular opinion is saying that no, mm. dads, uh, in this case, I'm using black dads, have value. And uh, so, so, so much of our work, I'm not looking for my wallet because uh, is emblematic of us taking the risk of finding value where there is no perceived uh, of value at all. Mm. And that is the story uh, well, one of the stories of uh, of fatherhood uh, 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 for, for for me, right? I'm just like I'm, I'm tripping now because I'm looking. I'm like, Where, where's that dollar bill? But anyway, <laughs> well, you, you see how easily I can uh, uh, get get distracted. But it's I think awesome. that this, um, advice I would give to all of the dads listening: uh, the stories of uh, your healing, the stories of uh, your family's uh, healing um is all around you right it is in your story it is in your children's story uh it is quite often uh arrived and derived from painful and hard moments absolutely right? and, and and how we uh, uh bounce back and resiliency is one of the uh core principles of the campaign for black male achievement right and i'm of the era you know with the timex watch you know how do you take a lick <laughs> and it keeps on ticking right there you go and it's not how far you fall, it's how high you bounce, right? Absolutely. Uh, that's the message, right, that uh, uh, undoubtedly there's a dad that's listening 
that is feeling blue, that's feeling down, that is feeling discouraged, right? For whatever reason, right? Maybe relationship, maybe job, it may be a, a child struggling, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I was reminded last week when your children struggle, uh, you can't take all, respons- all of the responsibility. Mm-hmm. Just like when they succeed, you can't mm-hmm. take all the credit. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. That. But there's a dad listening that needs to hear um, that in your pain, and in this moment, if you keep going through the process, don't quit, right? Uh, there's purpose in it and uh, tell the story, right? And even as mentors, right? Uh, we, 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 folks need to hear our story of struggle yes. just as much as they need to hear our struggle of, uh, of success, right? And so I'm gonna stop there because I feel like I've been on a rambling rant uh, for- It's uh, been good. Uh, it's been good, but I'm going to tell you, man, like everything that you're saying, I, and I love it. Usually I'm the talker, like I'm naturally the talker. And so when I have a brother who has a story, who has something to say, I'm just here to listen. And, you know, I'm here to present to the Black Fathers Now family, you know, different perspectives, but a brother who has a story, who has some insight. And, you know, you mentioned the whole concept of storytelling. And, you know, for so long, there were gatekeepers to the media right? There were gatekeepers to getting your story put out there. There were gatekeepers to allowing your story to get told. And we had to know this person, to know that person and get behind this one and have this relationship and pay this one just to get the opportunity to tell your story. And even then it was vetted, it was edited, it was whitewashed, it was, you know, sent, you know, uh, sanitized down to the notion of you almost don't even recognize it. But now in 2019, we have the ability to tell our stories and go directly to the people. And so that's why I'm such a huge proponent of telling stories, of sharing stories. And back to you, back to the thing that you mentioned about, you know, interviewing and bringing on other perspectives. It's not just about me. I'm not this Nostradamus, all knowing omnipotent figure myself, but I know one thing is that I might not have lived it, but there's somebody who has. There's somebody who's experienced that. There's somebody who brings a different perspective and a different angle to the table that will have the ability to connect with someone listening to this. And as you mentioned before, somebody listening to this needs to know that you are enough. Somebody needs to know that you're going to be all right. Somebody listening to this thing right now that's struggling, that's dealing with, you know, some type of hardship. And guess what? We're all dealing with some type of hardship. It might not be visible. It might not be financial or it might be not be a health thing or a relationship thing. Don't be, all, by, don't be fooled by Instagram. Don't be, don't be fooled by Instagram. There are filters, fellas. There are filters. And somebody took that shot that you see 40 times before they got that one picture yep, <laughs> on yep. Instagram. Don't get, don't get it twisted. And so we're all dealing with something. But to that point, by us sharing our stories, and you mentioned the notion of sharing the struggle The thing is, that then humanizes people. What I've come to realize is that nobody connects to perfection. Nobody can connect to perfection because we're not perfect. And there's a, it was a title, CeeLo Green had an album years ago, and it was titled CeeLo Green and His Perfect Imperfections. Mm. I was like, you know, honestly, that is the most perfect title I have ever heard because truthfully that sums me up and that sums up all of, us, all of us if we're honest about it. But a lot of times we're not honest. We're looking, you know, practice makes perfect. That's a farce. Nobody's going to be perfect. Practice makes you better, but practice is not going to make you perfect. And the thing is, your connection, your connectivity to other people are your imperfections because that's what they can see. They, nobody can sing like Luther. I mean, I know I can't. And so, uh, so, so the whole thing is connecting to him. I mean, I like to listen to his music, but I can't connect to it because ain't no way in the world I'm going to sound like it. You know what I'm saying? But the brother who's down there on the corner, who's all off key, I'm like, yo, I can dig that because it's imperfect and I can relate to it. So we have to do a better job of sharing those imperfections because those are the true perfect moments. Ooh, that's some good stuff right there, right? That's, mm-hmm. that, that's gold. Because what I continue to learn, right, mm-hmm. uh, as a father, right, because uh, look, uh, today is uh, what July 9th, uh, twenty nineteen, right? I've never been on Father this day, right? Mm-hmm. This is a, you know, every day is training day. You know? Absolutely, absolutely. No matter how old your kids are, right? yes. And what I've learned over the years, and still continue to learn, right, 
uh, it's real hard being a father, a parent, and trying to be a perfectionist mm -hmm. uh, at the same time. Yes. It's real hard if you are a control freak yes. trying to be, because uh, uh, stuff gets spilled, toilets get stopped up. Yes. Uh, uh, limbs Lord. Broken, plans. Uh, you know, uh, you're trying to get out, you know. So if you have to be able to create this adaptability and ability to go with the flow, right? Yes. Some, day, some days I'm good and some days, uh, 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 you know, not, not so much, right? And I do think that what we have to do as fathers is um, we got to kill that condemning voice. Yes. Yes. It tells us constantly uh, that we are falling short and, you know, we're not doing what we could do, right? Because uh, that, that voice is on the loop, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, I was talking about that other voice earlier. We got to focus on the other voice that, like, wow, you're doing great, right? Wow, you've come a long way. Yes, you may have fallen, but you've gotten up, right? And we have to, and I'm not in by no way saying that uh, we should condone uh, bad, poor, detrimental behavior uh, as fathers, right? But I do think that we need to kill that judgmental, uh, condemning voice mm. that uh, we often uh, have, right? And the problem is if we don't get in scenarios like this, even if it's like one-on-one, -on -one, absolutely, if we stay in isolation. Yes, that's dangerous. We don't get in places where we, there's trust when we could drop the mask. I say vulnerability is the new sexy, mm. right? Dude, you, you said something earlier and I wrote it down and it was from you know the recovery program. You said you're only as sick as your secrets. Yep. Right, I, I mean, and so I, that literally lies in the, the forefront of what it is you're just talking about. You're only as sick as your secrets. And so therefore, if we stay isolated, if we stay to ourselves over here and we don't have this environment, we don't have this in, in uh, community, we don't have a platform, or at least we don't have a person that we can share these things with and get them off of our chest. I mean, you think about like a, you know, a soda with a whole lot of, you know, carbonation built up and you shake it up. I mean, the thing is ready to blow, right? And so we have to figure out a way to let some of that stuff out whether it's individual, whether it's through therapy, whether it's through counseling, whether it's through just a community, we have to do that, especially as black men, because, you know, the machismo that we kind of rolled on from back in the day is gone. And that was, honestly, that was a, an Achilles heel that we had for so yeah. long. I mean, like you mentioned the brother with the, the platform about, about it's okay to cry. I mean, we, we, I have a little girl and a little boy now, so I mean, I'm I'm apt to cry at any time. I might be about to cry now. I don't know, but <laughs> I was holding back tears a little bit earlier. And, uh, that's the kind of organization I run. I, I got people on my team that have joined. They said, "God, I've never been with an organization people crying so much, right?" Uh -huh. And uh, it's that, therapeutic. That, that that vulnerability and it's a scary thing when a brother does not have at least somebody in his life that he can go to and say, look, I just did some stupid shit. Mm -hmm. That's real. This is what it is. Or even better, I'm thinking about doing some, doing stupid, some shit. stupid shit, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have a host of leaders uh, across the country uh, that are connected to the campaign for Black Male Achievement in, in our uh, network. And what I always say is that, uh, uh, particularly when you are leading in a, on a high level, that if you are not utilizing mentors, yes, executive coaches, and a therapist in your life on a regular basis, you are going to have some challenges, right? Mm. And I got mentors, I got executive coach, I got a therapist, and then I got some people in my life that I trust that I can say, look, I just did some stupid stuff. That's right. I'm thinking about doing some, or, 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 you know what? I'm scared, right? And so our ability to drop the mask, right? And that's why, that's what fatherhood now is about, right? That's mm. fatherhood 2019. Yes. That's not fatherhood 1970, mm -hmm. 1960. Or not even fatherhood 2000. That's true. That's true. Yes. I mean, it, it changes that rapidly. This is a recent 
accept, and we still got a long way to go with, uh, you know, the distorted uh, gender norms and toxic masculinity, uh, what it means to uh, uh, be a man and who's supposed to do uh, what uh, in the house. We, we got a long way to go still, but we yeah, have absolutely. come, in a, uh, and it's our generation. Yes. And, you know, and, and, and platforms like what you are uh, doing with Fathers Now, Black Fathers Now, um, that's really uh, uh, important. Man, I, I, have to, I have to jump in on this because um, you mentioned the concept of if you're leading on a high level and a high level can, can be subjective, right? I mean, you could be leading on a high level within your family or a high level within an organization where you got millions of people and billions of dollars at your disposal leading on a high level. But you mentioned that if you're leading at a high level and you don't incorporate mentors, executive coaches and therapy in the mix of it, you're selling yourself short. And, and brothers, I want you to listen there. Listen to that. Mentors, executive coaches, and therapy. Now, I, I will say you might not be at a point in which maybe you can afford an executive coach, but you can read the books of executive coaches. You can listen to podcasts of executive coaches. You can befriend, you know, folks who are executive coaches and, you know, just build relationships and have casual conversations, you know, in that regard in which you can start to get the wisdom of executive coaches. Mentors are everywhere. And it doesn't, when I say mentor, you don't have to have the quote unquote title of a mentor. A mentor is someone who is where you're trying to go or someone who has been through what you're currently going through or someone who is just a few steps down the road from where you are. And what's interesting about mentors I've come to find mentors who are younger than me. Like, it's interesting. We always think a mentor has to have a few more gray hairs than you do, have to have a few more wrinkles than you have. But I've come to find mentors in various spaces that might be half my age. It's interesting. I might find a mentor who's a teenager in something. I mean, to be completely honest, mentors are everywhere, but you have to be open to seeking that. And then as it pertains to therapy, fellas, therapy is needed and necessary. And we have so much healing that we have to do because if you don't have these things incorporated into your life to lead on a high level, you're setting yourself up for failure. And this is also a conversation for myself. These are things that I need to make sure that I'm plugging in the right places so that I'm fully ready for, you know, leading at a high level because truthfully, and this is a good conversation, like you mentioned earlier, how it's funny when you brought a speaker in to speak to the audience, they ended up, the story ended up hitting you. And it was almost like they were speaking directly to you. This, this conversation that we're having, yes, the brothers are listening and the ladies are listening in too and all, but you're talking to me. It's like, I need this. I need to make sure that I have these things in place so that that foundation is there so that, you know, I'm prepared to lead in the way that I know God's called me to lead. And so I appreciate you for dropping that because you're talking to me. So, wow, there's so much there, right? So one of the things, and I really love the fact that you shared and uh, for your uh, listening and watching audience that you have mentors uh, that are younger than you. Mm -hmm. um, vulnerability is a, a, a key word, but humility is also. Mm -hmm. uh, one of my leadership mantras, mission mantras is to uh, be humble as a lamb, yet bold as a lion, right? Mm -hmm. And it takes humility to be open to receive an insight and learning from someone that's uh, 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 younger than you. Yes. A lot of times it's around technology, right? Yep, yep, for real. <laughs> so, 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 that, so that, that's real, real important, right? The, the, the other thing that I would want to uh, just uh, uh, lift up, you know, is the, the, the vulnerability, the um, humility. And what's interesting, you know, last year uh, at the Cities United uh, Conference in Knoxville, mm -hmm. now, this in Knoxville about in May at the Alex Haley Farm. In oh, wow. oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So right now, Mike, I'm like, all right, we got to do a fatherhood conference at the Alex Haley Farm. Yeah, we're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make right. that happen. So, so yes. Let's push, like, yes. Like, be careful what you declare. It just might appear. Like, no, but, it's gonna happen. <laughs> so during the conference in Knoxville last year, there was an opportunity, and I'm uh, 
blessed to be one of the uh, uh, founding uh, board members of this organization called Cities United that works to create a, a healthy, whole, safe, uh, hopeful communities and, and, and eliminating violent deaths of black men and boys and working with mayors and community partners. Um, but we had this uh, panel and uh, we were asked to uh, say a word to um, Anthony Smith, who is uh, the executive director of uh, Cities United and would be a fantastic guest on this show. Mm. And when it got to me, and it was like, I had to ask him five questions. Uh, and these are questions that I'm grappling with, right? And, mm -hmm. and everything that I'm sharing with you is not on high, right? I'm dealing with it also, right? Absolutely. But, but, but these are the five questions, right? And, uh, and for all, uh, uh, for black fathers, right? This, these are five uh, black fathers now questions. And, 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 and the first question is, um, uh, what are you doing about your purpose? Mm. Right. And, 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 and you have a purpose. What are you doing about it? You know, sometimes we run from our purpose. Right? Mm. Sometimes we do self-sabotage and shit because of our, we know what our purpose is, right? So uh, what are we doing uh, about our purpose? Uh, the second question is, uh, what are we doing about our power? Mm. And we all have uh, relative power and influence. And, and, and sometimes we just give our power away, right? Mm. Sometimes we abuse our power. But what are we doing with our power, right? You're a prime example. you using your power of media and platform and creating this, right? Mm -hmm. and try not to editorialize each question, right? The, uh, the third question is, uh, what are you doing with your privilege? Mm. And some may say, oh, black, I'm a black man. I don't have, no, no, no. Uh, your gender gives you privilege. Mm. How are you, uh, your position and some, you, where you are with your education may give you privilege. What are you doing with your uh, 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 privilege, right? And, and, and as a a black father as a black man, right? And, and issues of patriarchy and, and uh, um, how are we handling our privilege, right? And what are we doing about privilege, right? And um, the last two questions, are, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when you're in a water, in a pool, there's a dip in the pool, you automatically get into the deep end, right? The last uh -huh. two questions are uh, deep end questions for, uh, for all of us, right? And uh, the fourth one is, um, what are we doing with our pride? Mm. Right? And that's a whole show right there. Oh, Lord have mercy. Yeah, what are we doing with our pride. And uh, the last is, and we were talking about this and, you know, the whole issue of uh, getting and asking for help and therapy and all of that is, what are we doing with our pain, mm. right? And how are we healing, right? And how are we transforming our pain into purpose, right? And uh, you never, as a black father, or as an individual, as a man, put a period on those five questions, right? Mm. They're, 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 they're iterative, right? But self-reflection is powerful, right? And uh, in this room, my mornings of burning incense and drinking coffee and mm -hmm. uh, uh, those are questions that I am um, uh, always grappling with. And uh, some days I'll have answers and some days I can, and some days I'm struggling, but what are you doing with your purpose, your power, your privilege, your pride, and your pain? Ooh, fellas, mic drop. I'm, if I didn't feel like I was going to break the mic here, I would pick it up and drop it on the ground because what are you doing with your purpose, your power, your privilege, your pride, and your pain? And honestly, that's a rhetorical, those are rhetorical questions for you to think about in your life. See, we ask questions and a lot of times people want to quickly give an answer. Fellas, I want y'all to sit there and marinate on this. You probably just need to push pause right now and think about it again. What are you doing with your purpose, your power, your privilege, your pride, and your pain right now? What are you doing with that? Brothers, I want you to think about that. I mean, those are deep. And as you take those five questions and you apply them to every aspect of your life, think about that through the lens of 
fatherhood, through the lens of marriage, through the, you know, through the lens of business and entrepreneurship, through the lens of community, through the lens of your church or your religious institution, through the lens of your interactions with other people, through your lens of, through the lens of being in America at this particular time, through the lens of being a citizen of the world. I mean, just taking a step back and thinking about that. What are you doing with your purpose, your power, your privilege, your pride, and your pain. And if you can answer those questions in the moment, and honestly, those things are gonna change because tomorrow's gonna bring something different, right? Mm -hmm. Next week, next month, next year is gonna bring something different. But if you can answer those questions in the moment, at any given moment, you're probably on the right track. Mm. Fellas, fellas. Now, now before, because I mean, literally, man, we need to allocate like eight hours to sit down and just talk with you because you're just so full of wisdom. But I'm I but, to come on a part, uh, a part, part two. Like, we, we, we're gonna have to, power. We're gonna have to get a second hour of power. But before we get out of here, man, I want you to definitely kind of lay out, kind of give uh, brothers an overview of campaign for Black Male Achievement, some of the things you all have going on, how the brothers can check you all out, different initiatives, anything that you want to share, and anything else that you want to kind of put out there um, that you have going on. I want to give you the floor, brother. Well, well thank you for that. And I'm just so blessed to uh, lead and be the CEO of the Campaign for Black Men Achievement, uh, which is a national uh, a membership uh, network of uh, men and women that are uh, committed to improving the life outcomes of uh, black men and boys. And CBMA, the Campaign for Black Male Achievement, we exist to uh, ensure that these leaders and organizations, that their work grows, that it sustains, uh, it has an uh, impact. And, uh, you know, I wanted to say that CBMA was started at the Open Society Foundations uh, back in 2008, and it was supposed to be a three year uh, term limited uh, uh, campaign, right? And uh, here we are celebrating uh, 11 years, right? And wow. So, uh, you know, in a uh, sense, uh, uh, we build community, right? We bring leaders together. Uh, we have um, field building activities. We uh, publish something called the Promise of Place that uh, looks at eight building blocks in cities that how do you increase engagement uh, for black male achievement in, in, in cities. Uh, we understand that it and it, it takes cross-sector leadership, right? That there is a, not one group, organization, or sector, right? That we bring together uh, folks from uh, community, uh, from the not-for-profit sector, philanthropy, business, um, the uh, and government. Um, and, you know, our promise of place mantra is that, you know, your promise of place is wherever you decide to take a stand. Mm. Uh, we do an annual gathering um, called Rumble Young Man Rumble at the Muhammad Ali Center. In Louisville, uh, yep. In, in Louisville that uh, is the preeminent uh, Black Male Achievement Gathering uh, in the nation. We have been doing it since 2011. Uh, we have declared uh, Louisville, at first with the Muhammad Ali Center, but Louisville as the epicenter for Black Male Achievement, right? And it's a place for us to come together. And so much of what we talked about and not the mm -hmm. of our conversation today, uh, it's not a conference. It's not a convenient to get, it's more a revival-like place for healing, right? Because wow. what we have uh, uh, come to realize, uh, the cavalry, you know, the iconic leaders, uh, the men and women, uh, we need healing. Yes. We need support. We need a place where we can uh, 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 exhale. And so uh, Rumble Young Man Rumble, we do that nationally. We also do it regionally. In September, we're doing it in, uh, uh, in Detroit. Uh, one of our core strategies is a BMA health and healing strategies that's uh, left, that's led by uh, Dr. Phyllis uh, Hubbard, where we deal with uh, and elevate the health, healing, and wellness of our leaders. Uh, we launched that about three years ago in partnership with the Oakland and Sacramento Unified uh, School Districts. Uh, strategic communications and storytelling mm. is a real uh, uh, focus of our, our work. And I say, you know, at the core of what our work is about is really elevating an asset-based uh, narrative around black male achievement. And, uh, wow. 
uh, the stories, right, and, and, and the premise is that there is nothing wrong with black men and boys in America at all, that it is the systems, the structure, structures, the, 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 the white supremacist policies and racism, that's the problem, right, yes. and, and not black men and boys. We also um, believe in strategic partnerships, right, that there's no one organization that is going to uh, uh, um, change things. Uh, one individual, right? The, the, the day of the Lone Ranger, mm -hmm. uh, I would venture to say, never existed. So strategic partnerships across sectors. And I would also say that our, uh, you know, theory of change, right? We want to change the outcomes and we want to move the needle around data. Uh, uh, you know, strong leaders plus strong organizations yes. with a strong field of black male achievement. Mm. And so get to that place and continue to get to that place and you know you know we, we, we're there but we got to keep a uh, 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 growing and being more effective we're never going to see the outcomes uh that we uh, want right and we also uh focus on measuring and promoting what's working right mm. what works engine right we have a partnership with a, a website uh bmafunders.org i encourage your listeners to go there uh the uh, website of the campaign for Black Male Achievement is uh, blackmaleachievement.org. Uh, I would encourage all the listeners, uh, men and women, to uh, go to our website. Here's a shortcut. It's uh, cbma.org backslash join to become a uh, member of the network and, 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 and uh, find a place and figure out where in your city, your town, and connecting with others to be part of uh, uh, this movement, right? And I will say that the uh, next level vision for uh, CBMA, and it was, uh, and what I didn't get a chance to describe is that, you know, we spun off from the Open Society Foundations in uh, 2015 into an independent uh, uh, entity, right? And something that's very rare to uh, happen, particularly for uh, black men in, in philanthropy. Uh, uh, me and my brother Rashid Shabazz, who was with me uh, um, for nine years, uh, we were together at the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. We were able to negotiate a $10 million deal to spend, or I call it leaving Egypt with a little gold. Right? Uh -huh, uh -huh. But what was the, 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 the driving force for that was I had this vision of creating uh, or transforming the campaign for Black Male Achievement into a corporation for Black Male Achievement. Wow. That would be an endowed philanthropic social enterprise that would lean into this issue for uh, the long haul. And uh, that, you know, we really need a uh, billion dollars for Black men and boys, right? Because mm -hmm. we are in a billion dollar fight with million dollar mindsets, right? Wow. Uh, we need resources. And so we're having this conversation, Mike, at a time where I am re remembering what was the genesis and what drove me. It was this vision of the Corporation for Black Male Achievement and realizing um, over the last three years that, you know, okay, you've done all this, Sean, and getting comfortable, right? But stopping short for and realizing what the true uh, uh, vision was. And so, uh, so I'm really in the process of remembering what I forgot, right? Mm. That was the reason why, and, and we do this sometimes, right? Yeah, we have and to. We, we uh, so, you know, we, 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 we let um, good be the enemy of our great. Mm. And that uh, I, I, I gotta make sure that I like take this, you know, our 10 year, uh, impact report and make sure that I like that's done. Yeah, that's right. It's like what's in store, what's next, and uh, realizing um, that the vision for the corporation for Black Male Achievement. And I have to, and I thank you, uh, keep putting myself in positions that I say this out loud. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because uh, sometimes, so even the spinoff, right? Uh, I whispered that to myself for a year, right? Uh, like, you know, we need to spin off. We need a corporation for black male achievement. And it wasn't until I said it, and I remember the moment that I did it. It was in December of 2011 in Miami. We were at a grantee convening in a closing circle. And we were going around and closing. That's the first time I said it out loud, right? Wow. 
I said, whoa, since you done said it, you might as well, uh, you know, keep saying it, right? And that was in 2011, and it took uh, another four years for it to actually happen. Uh, but, you know, this power in, 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 in words, right? And I think uh, I bring it back to uh, fatherhood, that one yes. of our roles as uh, dads is to be um, prophets and prophetic yes. in, in, in our uh, children's lives, right? And, and, and speak what should be, right? And, uh, you know, sometimes that's hard, right? If mm -hmm. uh, we're not being positively prophetic in our own lives <laughs> and the self-talk that we have with Absolutely. ourselves, how are we going to carry that into our children's lives, right? Prayer, Yes. Action. Yes. Uh, and, and being a provider, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and uh, not just our presence, but our presence and being present, you know. That's right. That's right. So, but you about, you about to get me on another hour roll. <laughs> that have right, uh, uh, right now, but uh, uh, I definitely want to uh, get advanced booking for mm -hmm. uh, uh, a round two. Because yes. I have been at speaking engagements where in opportunities they were like, I don't know who invited him, but he ain't coming back again. No, you're right? coming. You're coming back to Black Fathers now, my man. For real, for real. And yeah. fellas, fellas, I want to make sure that y'all really, really, really check out cbma.org backslash join and go join a campaign for Black Male Achievement. Visit blackmaleachievement.org, but then also bmafunders.org. Check out all of those things, and then also reach out if you come across Sean Dove on social media. Reach out to him. Let him know you heard about his story, his journey, you know, some of his ups, some of his downs. Let him know you heard about some of his story here on Black Fathers Now, the podcast. And um, and definitely. Oh, yeah. re Let me give them the, uh, the Twitter handle. Okay. Uh, my, so my Twitter handle is uh, Dove Soars, like flying, right? That's Twitter and uh, Instagram. It's Sean, S-H-A-W-N underscore Dove, like the bird. And uh Yes, thank you for saying that, brothers. If you uh, heard something that moved you or someone else needs to hear and, and, and boomerang, whether it was from me or from Brother Mike, because um, uh, uh, the host was dropping gem for gem. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back and forth, brother. That's you right, drop one, I drop one. That's how we roll. And, and, and let's share it, right? Let, that's it. Let, let, let's share it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and I thank you, man, for taking time out of your schedule. Like I said, it's been a long time coming, but the best things come to those who wait. I'm a firm believer of that. And this particular conversation is going to help somebody. I got a feeling it's going to help more than just one somebody. It's going to help a lot of somebody's. And, um, and I thank you so much for sharing your journey. And, you know, from this point forward, man, go ahead and consider Campaign for Black Male Achievement part of the Black Fathers Now family. So anything that we can do to help push the narrative forward, to help you in anything, any of these, like you mentioned, ideas come and you're ready to run with them, holler at us, man. We're here, we're ready to help you out any way, shape, or form, man. Well, I dropped the, the one that we can start with, not too far from you, mm -hmm. uh, the Black Fathers Now retreat mm. at the Alex Haley Farm mm. in Clinton, Tennessee. Yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. 20 minutes from you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's not not far at all, man. Not, not far at all, right? We're, and like you you mentioned, this power and putting it out there. So the Black Fathers Now retreat at the Alex Haley Farm is going to happen, and we're gonna me and Sean are gonna be in the works on that. So yeah, consider campaign for Black Men Achievement as a partner, a all, partner. Look at look at here. Hey, y'all heard it here first. We're gonna make it happen. I love I it. Know, I'm not putting no numbers out there. But I'm just saying. <laughs> I gotta find this dollar bill. What <laughs> <laughs> trip, man? I, I, I gotta find that. Oh, oh man! And it's the funniest thing. Look, so those watching on YouTube will know what we're talking about. Those that are listening to the podcast via audio are gonna be like, "What is? What are these brothers talking about with this dollar bill?" But either way, go back to YouTube and watch it and listen to it and you'll you'll get what we're talking about all right <laughs> listen I, I appreciate you brother i love you and stay strong you are uh transforming uh and helping folks that you will never ever, ever get a chance to meet uh you are helping children of uh fathers uh in an indirect way right so so you're having a generational impact uh with uh black fathers now and so i appreciate you for that
Man, I thank you so much. I receive it. I love you back, brother. And you keep up the good work. You keep doing the great work. And you and I are going to do some big things in the future. We appreciate this, man. Right. God All bless you. Right. God bless you too, man. Take care. All right. All right, you too, brother. Now, fellas, 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 as always, make sure to visit blackfathersnow.com. Subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, any way you listen to podcasts, make sure to check this out. Also visit blackfamilyapparel.com to grab some dope apparel to celebrate the nuances of the black family. And until next time, y'all be blessed, well, and wise. And I'll holler at you. Peace.